Hello everyone, I am Dr. Cassia Roth and I'm an assistant professor of history and Latin American and Caribbean studies here at UGA and I started teaching here in fall 2018. I'm also faculty advisor to the Demosthenian Literary Society and I'm an affiliate faculty member with the Institute for Women's Studies. So before I t um, get started today, I just want to thank the Multicultural Services and Programs for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, in particular, Dr. Sharonda Cooper and Dr. Jamel Hodges, and also all the other people who made this event possible tonight, especially during a pandemic, including IT and custodial staff um, and the grad assistant, uh, Gia Santiago. And finally, I just want to give a shout out to all my students uh, who are in virtual attendance, in particular, Sydney Parsons uh, from my Introduction to Latin American and Caribbean Studies class, who is the Cultural and Social Programming Co-Chair for Black Affairs Council this year. And I want to just say thanks to all the students who are taking time to listen tonight. I know this has been a, and this is an understatement, a really, really hard year. And so we appreciate you and we are here. And when I say we, I mean all of us at UGA. We're here to help you. And so if you're having trouble in your classes, reach out to your professors, reach out to MSP um, Student Care and Outreach. So the title of my talk today is Reproductive Justice, Interrogating Race, Gender, and Class in Our Fight for All Women's Bodily Autonomy. And so first I'm just going to explore the definition of reproductive justice, uh, its origins, and some examples of it in here in the United States. And then we're going to move to Brazil, which is where I do my research, and we're going to discuss how reproductive justice has played out in a different context. So, so what is reproductive justice? And I'm going to play a short uh, clip that presents the concept in a much better way than I could. Reproductive justice. A lot of people talk about it, but many don't know what it really means. Here's the basic idea. Coined by 12 black women in June of 1994, the term is the combination of two phrases, reproductive rights and social justice. The new phrase reflected the lives and experiences of black women in the United States who had been denied a full range of services and protections. Black women have multiple identities, like age, ability, sexual orientation, immigration status, religion, and nationality, just to name a few. Consider the fact that black women experience some of the highest rates of poverty and only make 63 cents for every dollar a white man makes. Nearly 20% of black women have no health insurance and die four times as often as white women from pregnancy-related causes regardless of income or educational status. The issue at play here is intersectionality, a term coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw which refers to how multiple systems of oppression work together. Reproductive justice is how we take on all the systems that harm us. Reproductive justice is the human right that can only be achieved when all women and girls have the complete economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, our families, and our communities in all areas of our lives. Reproductive justice centers the leadership and lived experiences of the most vulnerable, including but not limited to black women, women of color, LGBTQ people, and youth. So there you have it. Reproductive justice has given thousands of women a framework to change policy, improve services, collaborate with other social justice movements towards our collective liberation. For more information, contact In Our Own Voice at www.blackrj.org. Thanks for watching and welcome to the movement. feminist who coined the term is, quote, the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities, end quote. So as the clip said, in 1994, a group of black women gathered in Chicago to prepare for the United Nations International Conference on Population and Development, which was going to be held in Cairo, Egypt. And these women, including Loretta J. Ross, who's pictured here on the slide, recognized that the women's rights movement in the United States was, was led by and thus represented only middle-class white 
women. White feminists often only focused on abortion rights at the expense of all other issues. Thus, their goals did not defend the needs of women of color and other marginalized women and trans people. Black feminists agreed on the need to lead their own national movement that addressed the needs of marginalized women, families, and communities. And at the UN conference later that year, the world agreed that the individual right to plan your own family must be central to global development. So at its core, reproductive justice is rooted in an international framework of human rights. And as the clip demonstrated, reproductive justice combines reproductive uh, rights and social justice. So Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, which is actually based in Atlanta here in Georgia, further elaborates on the definition of reproductive justice as follows. And most of this is a quote um, from Sister Song. So at its core, reproductive justice is a human right. Reproductive justice is based on the United Nations internationally accepted Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a comprehensive body of law that details the rights of individuals and the responsibilities of governments to protect those rights. Two, reproductive justice is about access, not choice. So mainstream movements like the white-led second wave feminist movements have often focused on keeping abortion legal as an individual choice. That is, not necess that is necessary, but not enough, according to reproductive justice. Even when abortion is legal, many women of color cannot afford it or cannot travel hundreds of miles to the nearest clinic. And so reproductive justice advocates say there is no choice if there is no access. And third, and relatedly, reproductive justice is not just about abortion. Abortion access is critical, and women of color and other marginalized women also often have difficulty accessing contraception, comprehensive sex education, STI, prevention and care, alternative birth options, adequate prenatal and pregnancy care, domestic violence assistance, adequate wages to support families, safe homes, and so much more. So these definitions come from the Sister Song website. A reproductive justice advocate would argue that a woman needs to have a safe, legal, and affordable access to all reproductive health care. This includes contraception, abortion services, prenatal and postnatal health, and pediatric health care. But a reproductive justice advocate would also argue that a woman needs to have equitable economic and educational opportunities, as do her children, and that she needs to live in a place that is free of environmental and physical harm. So in other words, contaminated water is an issue of reproductive justice. The police killings of unarmed black men and women is an issue of reproductive justice. The outsized impact of COVID-19 on black, brown, and indigenous communities in the US is an issue of reproductive justice. So we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm a historian of gender, health, and race in Latin America, and specifically in Brazil. Um, so we're going to now look at an incident in Brazil, a 2015 to 2016 disease outbreak, um, and we're gonna analyze it through the lens of reproductive justice. But before, I just wanna briefly sketch out a history of the country, because that's what I do best, is tell students about history. So uh, Brazil was colonized in the early 16th century, so the 1500s, by the Portuguese. And like in the United States, the racist institution of chattel slavery drove the Brazilian economy. And in fact, Brazil forcibly imported nearly 5 million enslaved people, or nearly half of all enslaved people that landed in the Americas. And by Americas, I mean any country in North or South America. So compare that to the United States, which only imported 2% of all enslaved peoples, or less than 500,000. Moreover, Brazil was the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery, which it finally did in 1888, or over 20 years after the end of the U.S. Civil War. So today, Brazilians of African descent are roughly 50% of the country's population, putting Brazil as the country with the second largest Afro-descended population only behind Nigeria. And the racist inequalities that stemmed from slavery in Brazil continue to shape 
the lives of Brazilians of color. So black and brown Brazilians have worse health outcomes, lower education levels, and lower incomes. Uh, and I just want to say that race relations and discussions of race are different in Brazil and the United States. But the overarching racist legacy of slavery shapes both countries. Um, and in relation to this talk, race and class inequalities in, and as well as gender inequalities affect women's ability to achieve reproductive justice in Brazil. So let's explore reproductive justice in relation to the Zika virus. And so no, I'm not talking about COVID-19. Before COVID-19, um, there was a different virus that surfaced in Brazil. And in 2015, physicians found that infants born in Northeast Brazil uh, had microcephaly, which is a condition in which the infant's head is smaller than normal due to abnormal brain development in the womb. And it was not long before scientists linked the newly surfaced Zika arbovirus to fetal birth defects. So Zika is carried by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, um, and it causes a, a slight rash and a slight fever in people who contract it, but it can wreak havoc on the developing fetus. Um, and this mosquito also proliferates in urban areas without proper sanitation and sewage. So Aedes aegypti mosquitoes love big cities where there is not adequate piped water and where there's lots of standing waters for them to lay their eggs on. Um, so scholars soon compared the Zika virus um, with the what was called rubella or the German measles. Um, which came about in the 1960s in the United States. And so as with rubella, when a pregnant woman contracts Zika, she normally experiences mild symptoms of fever and rash. And also similar to rubella, but Zika wreaks havoc on the fetus. So this association of Zika which, with what is called congenital Zika syndrome, um, which is, includes microcephaly and other fetal malformations, has catalyzed discussions of reproductive justice across Latin America. So in the United States, the rubella epidemic or outbreak of the mid-1960s foregrounded the issue of abortion. So middle-class white women who contracted rubella during pregnancy began to discuss the issue of abortion openly. Um, and these discussions changed the debate around illegal abortion because abortion was illegal that time in the United States. And the public began to support the respectable married white woman who wanted an abortion in consultation with her husband and physician. Um, but in reality, it was still very difficult for even middle class white women to um, get therapeutic abortions if they had contracted rubella. Um, so it remained inaccessible to most women. Moreover, this response to a disease outbreak in the US by just focusing on abortion was not taking a reproductive justice approach. So did the Zika virus change the debate around abortion and reproductive justice in, a, in Brazil and across Latin America? Initially, the answer seemed negative. In 2015, when the disease first surfaced, a top public health official in Brazil advised Brazilian women, quote, don't get pregnant now. And health officers in many other Latin American countries said the same thing. And this is interesting because in Latin America, um, birth control can be difficult to obtain, more than 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, and rates of sexual violence are very high. And moreover, in most cases, abortion is illegal in Brazil. So today, abortion is only legal in cases of rape to save the mother's life, and since 2012, in cases of fetal anencephaly, which is when a birth defect in which the infant is born without parts of the brain and skull and will not survive outside of the womb. So in 2004, a group of lawyers and activists filed a motion with the Brazilian Supreme Court to allow for abortion in cases of anencephaly. And it took eight years for the Supreme Court to decide that yes, they were going to allow women to receive abortions if they had this if their um, infant had this birth defect, um, which, as I said, the infant cannot survive outside of the womb. So the same legal team that filed that initial plea for the other birth defect filed a similar plea to authorize abortion for microcephaly, um, which is also diagnosable in utero. 
The petition, however, is based in a reproductive justice framework because it has five demands that, in addition to legalizing abortion for pregnant women who have been infected with Zika um, and who are in mental distress, advocates for better family planning methods and expanded health information for women of reproductive age. And the group argues that Brazilian women should not be punished for the government's complete failure to control the Aedes aegypti mosquito that transmits the Zika virus. So adequate housing and urban development, including sanitation and running water, would have helped address the spread of the disease because the disease really proliferated in poor urban slums that didn't have these services. Um, so the advocates said this is a reproductive justice approach. They acknowledge that upper class women have access to safe, if illegal, abortions in Brazil because they can pay physicians to perform the procedure discreetly and safely. But in contrast, poor women, often women of color, have to resort to life-threatening illegal procedures. And of course, it is poor women who live in the urban slums that lack running water and basic sanitation, hot spots for the Aedes aegypti mosquito that leave their larvae on the water tanks and open sewage littering the neighborhoods. And so researchers have found that the most effective approach toward combating mosquito-borne diseases is not increasing the uses of insecticides and larvicides, whose effects on humans at best is unknown and at worst is carcinogenic, but expanding basic sanitation and reliable treated running water sources to poor urban neighborhoods across Brazil. Or reducing structural inequalities would go a long way. But now it seems that the state in Brazil has receded from providing those services altogether. Um, and as I said, Zika affected the north and the northeast regions of Brazil the worst. And these areas are marked by, according to one public health expert, high levels of poverty, poor infrastructure, scant health services, and a substantial Afro-Brazilian population. Subpar sanitation, limited or no access to piped water, and irregular waste collection have all contributed to the spread and penetration of the Aedes aegypti mosquito into the poorest communities. And researchers also found that young black Brazilian women receive the worst health care, even though Brazil is a country with universal health care and where the right to health care is enshrined in their constitution. So, I just have this quote here from activist Deborah Diniz in Brazil who argues, quote, there would be no epidemic like the one in Brazil had the land not been hospitable to the explosive spread of the disease thanks to its mosquito populations, poor sanitation, and feeble public health policies for addressing new diseases, end quote. So Brazil was not the only Latin American nation to experience a Zika outbreak in 2015-2016. Um, and its abortion laws and reproductive health care access um, are more lenient and better when compared to other countries that have had similar outbreaks, including in El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Um, in El Salvador, a country often imprisons women for having miscarriages, and the idea that Zika will open up a debate about abortion rights is almost unimaginable. Um, and clearly, debate about women's access to all, as all aspects of reproductive health care is vital if 21st century governments truly want to include women as full citizens and not as a sum of their reproductive parts. Um, Although many countries across Latin America have recriminalized abortion in the region, there is some hope for advocates of abortion rights and reproductive justice. So Mexico City in 2007, Uruguay in 2012, and most recently in Argentina in 2021, legalized abortion in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And for example, in Argentina, it is part of free healthcare services. And so remember that legal abortion only meets reproductive justice demands if it is accessible, or in other words, affordable to all women. After its own Zika outbreak, Colombia decriminalized abortion for women who contracted the virus during pregnancy. So as these developments highlight, the fight to advance women's bodily autonomy and rights in Latin America is neither linear nor uniform and it occurs within larger structural inequalities that constrain the choice of all women, but especially poor women and poor women of color. 
So in Brazil, the government now states that the Zika crisis is over. And in doing so, the Brazilian government has missed the larger point. Zika was never only about mosquitoes. It's about women's health and rights for all Brazilians. So what about the women who gave birth to babies with microcephaly and don't have the resources to raise them? Women like Hakeli and her daughter Eloisa, pictured here. What would a reproductive justice approach toward the problem look like? In Brazil, during the Zika epidemic, reproductive justice would have meant supporting women who wanted abortions, supporting women who wanted to keep their children, and providing the required health and social services to all families to raise their children in an equitable and safe environment. So Sister Song argues that to achieve reproductive justice, we must engage in four approaches. First, we must analyze power systems. So in Brazil, this means understanding the racist and classist policies that made certain women more vulnerable to Zika. Second, we must address intersecting oppressions. To help the women and their children born with microcephaly, we must fully understand that marginalized women experience multiple oppressions. Many of these women are women of color, they are poor, they live in rural areas or in urban slums. They face racial, class, and gender oppression. All of these intersecting oppressions must be named and then addressed. Third, we must center the most marginalized. These women and their children must be at the core of any governmental or health policy. If we can meet their needs, we can meet all people's needs. And finally, we must join across, we must join together across issues and identities. Activists can connect the specific Zika epidemic to other causes and issues. How is the Brazilian government responding to the COVID-19 pandemic? I can tell you right now, not well at all. It's President denies that it's an issue. What is the state of reproductive health care and education today in Brazil? Is economic inequality increasing or decreasing? How is climate change affecting the spread of disease and what is the government doing in response? Climate change and environmental justice are also issues of reproductive justice. And the continued emergence of new viruses, including the coronavirus, is in part connected to environmental degradation and climate change. So climate justice and reproductive justice are linked. So I just want to end uh, with these women and their children in Brazil. We are going to watch a short clip of Brazilian women who had Zika while pregnant. Um, and this movie, this film, excuse me, is available for free on YouTube. It's called Zika, and it's around 30 minutes long. And don't worry, we're not going to watch all of it. Um, we're just going to watch the credits where the filmmaker uh, has talked to women who gave birth to children with microcephaly and who are now struggling to raise them in a safe and equitable environment. And I just want to center their voices here at the end. So I will start now. Eu sou a Adriana, tive zika no terceiro mês de gravidez e a Maria Sofia nasceu com microcefalia. Isso é de Cataleda Rocha. Meu nome é Edna, eu tive zika com oito meses e eu moro aqui em Copina Grande. Eu sou Maria Carolina, sou de Esperança. Essa é minha filha Maria Gabriela, tem dois meses. Eu tive zika durante a gestação e minha filha nasceu com microcefalia. Meu nome é Alda, sou de Caturité, eu tive a Zika com 3 meses e ele tem microcefalia. Meu nome é Amanda, tenho 19 anos, sou aqui de Campina Grande, ele tem microcefalia e eu tive Zika. Meu nome é Josimari, moro em Algodão de Xandaíra, sou mãe de Gilberto, tive a Zika e ele tem microcefalia. Meu nome é Yanka, tenho 18 anos, 
É, tive zika com três meses e ela tem microcefalia. Meu nome é Suzy, eu venho da cidade de Monteiro. É, minha filha tem microcefalia e eu tive zika no segundo mês de gravidez. Sou Miriam, a Inês nasceu em Serra Branca. É, eu venho em São José dos Cordeiros, eu tive zika com oito meses. E logo quando ele nasceu, a médica falou para mim que ele nasceu com microcefalia. Meu nome é Silenide. Eu sou de Solidade, sou mãe de Yane. Yane tem três meses. Ela tem microcefalia. Eu tive zika, eu estava com três meses de gravidez. I want to thank you so much for listening to me talk tonight and um, to listening to these women who um, are still struggling to raise their children uh, in adverse conditions. And I just want to alert students to an upcoming event that is part of the Institute for Women's Studies Women's History Month. Uh, and on Monday, March 8th, which is International Women's Day, Dazon Dixon Diallo, the founder of Sister Love Incorporated, which is a leading women's HIV, sexual, and reproductive justice organization, will be in dialogue with UGA students. So it is free and open to all, and the Zoom event begins at 3.30 p.m. So come hear a leading reproductive justice organizer speak about the issue uh, in more depth. And I just want to say thank you again to everyone. And at the beginning, I forgot to mention uh, to thank John Alvarez Turner, who also helped make this event happen. So I really look forward to your questions. Um, and thank you. So the first question is, what can be done to implement effective strategies to ensure equal health access to all women? This is a very important question and multifaceted. But the most basic thing to ensure equal health access to all women is to make sure all women have health insurance. So if that in the United States, that would mean having a single payer health care option where the government could provide health insurance. Um, in other countries, this takes on different forms. So healthcare in Brazil, as I said, is a human right. Uh, excuse me, it's a constitutional right. It's part of the Brazilian constitution. Um, and so the government created what's called the Unified System of Health, which is in, in Brazilian acronyms, it's SUS or SUS. And you can go to any SUS clinic or hospital for free. The thing is, is that, of course, it's underfunded, um, and there's always long wait lines, and um, SUS has been very, very hard, badly hit with COVID-19 in Brazil, and it hasn't had the adequate resources. Um, so Brazil ensured that everyone had access to healthcare, but if you don't fund that access, then is it really access, right? But I would think that, at least in the United States, we need to have an understanding, first of all, that everyone has a right to health care and that that right, whatever way we, we implement that right, that it is part of our rights as citizens of this country. Um, and once you implement it, you have to make sure that everyone is getting equal access. So that's understanding how different communities um, use and want health care. It means having health care that's grounded in cultural understandings, right? Um, but I think at the basic, at its core, we all need to have access to health insurance in this country. So thank you for that in question. So the next question is, has the election of the far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, greatly affected reproductive justice for women in Brazil, particularly poor women of color? Yes, yeah, so in 2018, uh, President Jair Bolsonaro, uh, who is called by the media Brazil's Trump, um, was elected president, and I actually think he is, um, well, I don't know, I don't want to compare uh, elected leaders, but he's far right. He has um, played down the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and has really done nothing. It's running rampant in Brazil right now. So for example, I have a good friend who lives in Manaus, which is in an Amazonian city, 
and that's a city that is, uh, has high levels of inequality and high levels of poverty, and my friend is middle class, um, so she had access to better healthcare services, and still her mother, her father, and her brother all died of COVID. And this is because, um, as in her words, she called it, uh, that Bolsonaro has, had let this happen to her, her family. So in, related to, in relation to reproductive justice, he is a far right leader. He, would, he, is, he is not interested in advancing abortion rights, expanding healthcare services, um, reducing inequality, all things that are part of reproductive justice. So people's lives have gotten much, much harder in Brazil. Now I will give him some credit that during the pandemic, he did um, get passed through Congress um, uh, relief bills that gave monthly stipends to low-income families, uh, in particular families who worked in the informal sector that didn't have any access to uh, formal unemployment benefits. Uh, but that's just a temporary fix. And he has just created more, in general, he actively um, mocks LGBTQ individuals. He said that he'd rather have his son be a murderer than gay. He has uh, told women in Congress when he was in Congress that they were too ugly to be raped. So he has created a culture in which misogyny and racism can flourish, right? Um, and which makes it harder to organize. And I think just with COVID-19, there is so much suffering going on in Brazil right now that other aspects, like you know, the Zika virus and that issue has sort of faded into the background, but those women with, with children with microcephaly, those children still have microcephaly, but they're not getting the services they need, right? So it's made it even worse. I could go on and on about him, but uh, he's not worth that time. <laughs> what are the bars to women getting access to birth control in Brazil? Are they only economic? That is a great question because birth control in Brazil is actually easier to access than here in the United States if you have the money. So uh, you can just go to a pharmacy. You don't necessarily need a prescription for birth control. So it is really about economic access. Um, but I will say this is that Brazil has a lower birth rate than the United States. Um, and one of the real issues about access to birth control is that, so in Brazil, you can access it. Um, and through the public health services, you can get it free of charge. But a more important under, uh, underlying issue is education. So when women have um, higher education levels, they delay childbirth and they have fewer children. That's just, that is a trend across the globe. And Brazil has really failed on providing equal opportunities for education for women. And so that's where I think the real issue lies. It's not necessarily, you don't have this, um, the same religious opposition to birth control in Brazil, but you do have this, these larger underlying issues about educational access. So the notion that many, this last question, the notion that many issues are seen as reproductive justice issues is interesting. Do you think that if racism was framed as a reproductive issue, we would make more headway in that area? That is a great question. And I think reproductive justice advocates, I'm, I mean, it's, it's not a coincidence that reproductive justice, the founders were all black women, right? And so they viewed their race as inseparable from their gender and inseparable from their reproductive lives. Um, can I keep the question up? Sorry. <laughs> Um, and I don't make more headway in that area. I think that by pinpointing intersecting identities and intersecting issues, it makes it easier to sort of understand them and to begin to tackle them. Um, I mean, I think that on the one hand, you can say, well, everything seems like it could be a reproductive justice issue. But you know, life is reproduction. So in that sense, yes. I mean, I think reproductive justice advocates, they still sort of have that, and I don't want to speak for them, but you know, that core of health care um, as part of their sort of central idea. But if you think about it, if one of the, the realms of reproductive justice is that your kids can grow up safe, then police killings are an issue of reproductive justice because certain kids are not as safe. Um, 
But I think one thing about reproductive justice advocates is they have really built those ties across social justice organizations. And what I find most inspiring about, about the movement is that it has allowed for these connections. So I think these connections are occurring and I think it just brings more people into the fold, if that makes more sense. So, um, okay, there's one more question, sorry. Are there any current initiatives, bills we could support in the U.S. to further reproductive rights and justice? So, on the what you have sort of, I'll, I'll start with abortion. Which remember, reproductive justice is not just about abortion, but um, you have sort of two different uh, trends going on in the United States right now. One, you have states like California, New York which are creating more protections for abortion access in case Roe v. Wade, which is the 1973 U.S. Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion here in the United States, in case that gets struck down by the Supreme Court. On the other hand, you have more conservative legislatures like in Georgia, in Alabama, in Ohio that are doing the exact opposite, that they're putting into place more restrictive laws um, and laws that would completely criminalize abortion if Roe v. Wade were struck down. So if you're interested in reproductive rights, I, uh, specifically abortion rights, I would, I would you know, urge you to look at what's going on in your state legislature because that's where the change is gonna happen. We can't control what happens at the Supreme Court anymore because new justices have been appointed, right? So what's going on in your state? And it's always good to know what's going on in your state legislature um, because those are the issues that are gonna affect your life the most. So your state legislature decides you know, about the HOPE scholarship and the Zell scholarship and the funding for UGA. And so you, you want to know who your state representatives are. So I would say to start there first. Um, but more generally, I think if we want to expand this to reproductive justice, as I said, access to universal health care would be a very important um, step on the federal level, right? Um, or even in your state. Um, that that is in a crucial part of reproductive justice in the United States. Um, coming back to this idea of police killings, right? So are there going to be any um, reform initiatives about um, how the police act, both you know, federally, which the federal government doesn't control police forces, um, but they can set the tone, or again, within your state or your local jurisdiction. So, you know, uh, you always want to think that it's not just what's going on at the federal level, but also what's going on at the state and local level. Um, and I think that, you know, in Athens, if you're interested in working on reproductive justice, um, the Athens anti-discrimination movement, which isn't a quote-unquote reproductive justice movement, but it's a social justice movement, um, and it was started by a black woman, right, is somewhere that you could get really involved in local issues and see how reproductive justice is playing out on the ground in Athens and then move up to the state house from there. So that was a little bit of a meandering um, answer, uh, but federally, we need universal health care. State and local, you need to see what your local representatives are doing and get tapped into the local um, social justice organizations, which there are plenty in Athens. I just named one. Awesome, so um, thank you so much. Am I still on? Oh, I'm still on. <laughs> um, I just wanna say thank you for all these great questions. And um, again, to everyone here at Multicultural Services and Programs, um, and have a great evening.